Hey guys, welcome to Jay Hauser Writes. I'm Jay Hauser. I have written a novel which is available for pre-order right now. So <laughs> let's get into it. We've got hardback, paperback, and a pre-order giveaway and a free short story on my newsletter. So we're just going to plug all that stuff and check out the description down below. Um, today we're going to give you a taste of the prologue. So I'm going to read out of this here proof copy. We've got the Greenlands map art. We've got a video on that process. Cedar Shadow Wars, book one in the Cedar Wars series. Prologue. Bordered by impassable mountains, a pocket realm tucked away on earth was safely shrouded from human knowledge and interference. The hidden paradise was a land of beauty and lush plant growth, filled with an energy that coursed through the very veins of the people who lived there. The inhabitants could sense the cyclical energy shifts associated with the human world, though their own realm lacked any true change in season. On the western front, people lived simple lives in quaint communities, as simple and quaint as they could be in the midst of a never-ending war. Muriel stared down at her clutch of seedlings, her children. She wore a faint smile, her joy tainted by the vicious aching in her heart. Today would be the hardest day of her life. Thod walked up behind Muriel, wrapping his arms around her. He moved her auburn hair to the side and placed a sweet kiss on her cheek. Are you going to be okay? She swallowed hard, reminding herself that she had signed up for this. She wanted kids. Muriel turned to face her husband, giving him the best smile she could muster. I'll be great. She looked around at the new home they'd just moved into. Like others lining their lane, it was much bigger than the tiny cottage they'd moved out of. It was beautifully simplistic with raw, natural wood. Books and potted flowers covered the shelves in the corner. The extra space and larger garden out back would be just enough for the next phase of their lives. Thod gazed into her eyes. I couldn't have picked a better woman to raise my boys. Muriel drew a deep breath, her smile warming. I'll make you proud, and I know you'll take good care of the girls. He nodded, then patted his pants pocket. I've got the letter for your dad. Anything else? She pursed her lips, thinking of the human dad that had helped raise her. Letters were all they had now. Having reached maturity, which allowed her to have a clutch, she wasn't capable of leaving the Greenlands anymore. She scanned Thod, then glanced back at their seedlings. I think we're all set. Muriel pulled him closer. There's just one last thing. They shared a smile and she leaned in, giving him a kiss. The kind of kiss only a cedar woman could give the kind that imbued him with a portion of her energy, both expressing her love and bolstering him for the long and difficult journey ahead. It being the first day of spring, Muriel and Thod gathered their seedling hopefuls and stepped outside. Walking a few feet from the door, they placed the glistening round seeds on the dirt in the middle of the lane. A handful of neighbors were proudly doing the same with their own clutches for this year's sprout reveal. Muriel breathed deeply, tightly gripping Thod's hand and forcing herself to soak in the wonder and beauty of the moment. As the sun rose, it peeked over the wooden homes and bathed the eager parents, waiting in anticipation. Shortly after the rays reached the seeds, they began to wiggle. Next door, a shout of glee rang out. Someone's first seedling had sprouted. Muriel and Thod glanced over for just a moment to check it out, then returned to watching their own clutch. Puff, there's one. Thod rejoiced, squeezing her hand. Puff, puff, puff. Come on, girls, show yourselves. Muriel cheered in a whispered tone. Twelve in total sprouted. The other twelve remained unchanged. The breeze blew and the palm-sized sprouted balls of fluff began to sway. Muriel and Thod knew their time was short. They embraced and then Thod stood next to the seedlings like the other men in the street were starting to do. A gust rushed past. This was the one. The wind swept up the balls of fluff, resembling dandelion seeds floating in the wind, but much more fluffy, like a Bichon Frise puppy. As soon as they lifted up, Thod sprang into the air, leaping forward into a somersault, transforming into his botanical form. His hair took on a purple hue, spiked like a thistle. A spiny leaf extended from each forearm between his wrist and elbow. His legs were now wrapped in tap roots to his ankles. Thod gathered their twelve sprouted seedlings in his arms and gave a reassuring, loving look to his wife down on the ground. The breeze blew them higher and higher, further from their village. Muriel watched on as he disappeared from sight past the lush hills in the distance. The knots in her stomach took over as she imagined the journey ahead of him and the time and space soon to be between them. 
years in a completely different realm and there was no other choice. Wiping tears from her face, Muriel drew a deep breath and followed the example of the other women, taking her remaining seedlings back inside. She carefully laid them in a basin filled with earth. Sitting down, she gazed lovingly on her little boys, her heart swirling with a mix of emotions. Delighted to see her family grow, gutted by her mate's departure, and indignant at the other occupants of the Greenlands, the Ivies. The Ivies considered themselves superior and insisted they'd been cheated out of prime land centuries ago, which was far from the truth. They deserted their claim to those lands and devastated the new region they now resided in. Not that truth held much weight in old feuds littered with propaganda. Muriel's eyes glowed green as she no longer tried to hide the change. This was the only way their species could survive anymore, by tearing their families apart. Over a century ago, the ivies had poisoned cedar territories. Ivy poison, produced by their females, was strong enough to kill a human, but not a cedar. The cedar males were barely even affected by the attack. Future generations of females exhibited less power. Most devastating was the effect it had on the young cedar daughters. Not having their powers yet, they were essentially human, defenseless. Every last one of them perished within a week of the great poisoning. After girls in new clutches also failed to survive, the true and lasting effects were realized and drastic measures had to be taken to protect their young. A knock on the door broke Muriel from her trance. She wiped away more tears and centered her energy, her eyes changing back to a deep shade of brown. She opened the door with a smile. Hey, come in. Sandra, her new neighbor, a short woman with light brown hair who was also in her late 20s, entered, giving Muriel a long hug. Just wanted to see how you're doing. Muriel grinned, pulling back and gesturing for her to sit down. I expect we're feeling about the same. Sandra gave her an understanding frown. They'll be okay. Muriel nodded. I know. She picked at her fingernails. It's just different when it's your own. Sandra crossed her legs, resting her hands on her knees. How old were you at the time of your bloom? 16. Right. I forgot. I was 17. So many years of waiting, of separation. Muriel glanced down at her remaining seedlings. The boys always took longer to sprout, but by nightfall, they would start to form roots. She vowed to enjoy every moment she had with them before their childhood would be replaced with training. Whether protecting their homeland borders against ivy attacks or crossing over into the human world, the boys all shared one thing. They would be soldiers. Looking up with a forced smile, Muriel added, I'll feel so much better once the first one is old enough to go over for protection duty. Sandra sighed, we've got this. She gave Muriel a calm smile, standing back up. I just wanted to pop in real quick, but I better get back to my own boys. You know where to find me. Muriel walked Sandra to the door, giving her another hug. I'm glad we're neighbors. Muriel spent the rest of the day preparing a vegetable stew and coconut almond biscuits. She constantly looked over at her boys. Not that anything had changed about them yet. They were still little glistening seedlings full of potential. It would be a couple weeks before their roots developed enough to shed their seedling forms, rapidly growing to appear like any regular human. Sitting down after sunset, Muriel grabbed her journal from the shelf. Day one. She processed her thoughts and feelings before she began to write. Human teenagers have it so easy. Then again, when she'd been a teenager before her bloom, she would thought she was an average human too. It wasn't enough for the ivies to attempt genocide and lay siege to cedar borders. Fully rooted female cedars were twice as powerful as their males. Their energy was used to charge the border walls that kept their lands relatively safe from further ivy attacks. With these girls being the only thing that kept the ivies from their goal of cedar annihilation, their safety was paramount. When the ivy kingdom had discovered that cedars were hiding their daughters away in the human world, it became their new hunting ground. The ivies knew their enemy well. They focused on finding the girls during the vulnerable bloom to root period when their powers came in. Ivy assassins lay in wait, always watching for a hint of a bloom. Muriel put her pen to paper. I miss him already, and our girls. I look forward to seeing each one of their faces someday. She grinned, thinking of her boys. This is going to be quite the adventure. Things will work out. I know they will. I have to believe it. 
Muriel tried to imagine the faces of each of her girls, what interests and personalities they would have. Each day without them, without Thod, would be a battle. But she was confident in her husband. He had done so much work ahead of time, planning and preparing to keep them safe for the coming years. The fate of the Cedar Girls relied on one thing. Who was in the know? In the mix of it all were the humans, oblivious to the hunt happening around them. The two enemies constantly trying to sniff and snuff each other out. In their own realm, Cedars had no need to be on the offensive. In the human world, they watched over their daughters and sisters, always observing for signs of the ivies. Once the girls were old enough, they would show signs of budding, and then bloom, gaining their full powers. Their family just needed to keep them safe and guide them home without being discovered. And so the game went, as if high school wasn't already enough of a jungle. So that's the prologue. To prologue or not to prologue, that is the question. <laughs> Especially with fantasy, prologues are not necessarily in vogue, but for me, it, I just, I couldn't find a way around. I really did not want to do a prologue when I first started writing this book, but there, there really wasn't a way. That prologue is maybe a little more poetic because of the descriptions, and then it goes into maybe more standard contemporary prose, and we just jump right into Mel, Melody Walters, and what's her conflict? Who's her friend? What's her family like? And this journey of asking ourselves for a while, who is her dad? Who are these brothers? And are there ivies in her high school? Well, clearly, right? <laughs> but hiding in the shadows are the shadow wars, where the humans are not aware of all the goings on and trying to figure out who's who. So there's definitely a lot of mystery to it, but also the wonder of discovering magic, discovering who you want to be, the definition of what is family. So anyway, I hope you enjoyed that prologue. For me, it was important to have the setup so you know what to look for, because otherwise it reads as pretty standard contemporary fiction for a while until the crap hits the fan and you realize like, oh, and then you can be like, oh, see, I thought that person was good. I thought that person was bad. You know, you kind of add the clues out and without understanding the stakes, you wouldn't be on the lookout. So it was important to put that there. It's also a totally guilty pleasure because this entire series started off with the scene of, of the sprout reveal. So every spring on the first day, they have the sprout reveal where the daughters puff up and the boys wait. That's just one of those things about the differences in the sexes and the genders. And um, that was just the snippet of the dream that I had one day that started this thing. It was just like this um, dandelions. I had probably been doing yard work the day before and blowing in the wind, the seeds. And I don't know, there was like a foreboding, like they're, they're going into hiding. Well, why are they going into hiding? Well, they're being hunted. And I don't know, just like this whole premise and this whole world and these social dynamics. And it just got so much more deep and evolved as I just started writing. So I needed to have that scene in there. I needed to see what it's like. Um, also just the agony of family because family is very central in the entire series and quite frankly, in a lot of my writing. So anyway, thank you for joining me. If you think you're interested in picking up a full thing and getting to know Mel's, Mel's story, <laughs> it's available for pre-order as the sign says. So I'll read the back again, the back cover blurb. So, well on the front it says, right? Cedar Shadow Wars, book one, dating in high school, hard enough. Now at Assassins. So on the back it says, avoiding assassination wasn't on Mel's to-do list for her junior year. Learning she wasn't human hadn't made the list either. An only child with overprotective parents, Melody Walters just wants a drama for a year and to be able to date. She gains the interest of more than one suitor, but doesn't realize any one of them could be an enemy on the hunt. For her, the dating scene could prove deadly. Mel discovers she's a member of a botanical race, forced to hide their daughters in the human world until they mature enough for their powers to bloom. Something goes wrong with her blooming process, breaking her cover and jeopardizing the lives of her protectors and the large family she'd never known about. With the enemy threat ever looming, in a rush to master her new powers before she's stranded in the human world forever, Mel struggles to decide who she can trust and if the sacrifice being asked of her is too great. 
So there are stakes. It's not just assassins. There are limitations in this hard magic system. There's a lot emotionally to unpack and navigate and join Mel on her journey as she does so. So thank you for joining me. Thank you for your support. Check out the description below for all the goodies and have a wonderful, wonderful day.